Welcome back, everybody, to You Have Permission, the show that aims to take both Christianity and the modern world of science and culture very seriously. My name's Dan Koch. I'm a licensed therapist and a post-evangelical liberal Protestant who's trying to let Jesus take the wheel on the way to church while I furiously research this new church and whether or not they're going to indoctrinate my children. And I'm joined today by Meredith Miller, a uh, multi-time guest now. What what is the name of your what is the name of your work that you do? It's a lot of it's under your name, but did you have like a a lot like of it's under my name? name um, but I am the author of a book called Woven, and I write on Substack, creating something called the Great Big Bible Story Walkthrough. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and I just think of you as like my number one go to person on really teaching like spiritual education of children um, within this Christian tradition that we both come from, but trying to do it in thoughtful ways. I think we're going to start there. Um, people will link to your previous episode or episodes. Uh, I, I, we've spoken so much. I think you've been on twice. Certainly there's at least a patron episode and a regular episode. I think if that's not what a, we have. Yeah. Okay. I was, I wasn't, didn't remember if there was another main feed episode. I think this is the second, but we'll, we'll link to those episodes uh, for listeners if they want, but I, but it, it did seem to me to be a good idea to start at the basics of what you do, because where I want to go from there, uh, basically, I want to talk about two things today after we have a, sort of set the stage. The first is, how do we take an approach like yours, a healthier approach that focuses on the character of God in, in, our, in the spiritual education of our children, when we don't have very much certainty about the character of God? That's the main question that I think that I certainly am, am struggling with. And I know a lot of listeners will relate. And then the second one is I got a great listener question from Abigail asking for a revamp of the Lord's prayer. Uh, and she expressed there's some baggage that she's got with four particular aspects of it. And I thought rather than like, I didn't rewrite the Lord's prayer for this episode and I didn't want to ask you to rewrite the Lord's prayer either, but I thought that would be a nice conversational rubric to talk through those four things that she mentioned. So we're going to kind of set you up, talk about how we do this with, with less certainty about God and then apply it and kind of everything else to the Lord's prayer. So I'm excited. Um, Meredith, let me start by a brief description of what I, how I see what you do. And this is from both your Instagram posts and other things in our conversations. You're trying to avoid one really common thing in children's Christian education, and you're trying to replace it with one other thing. And the thing you're trying to avoid is making children's spiritual education primarily a means to get kids to be obedient, basically good little kids. And that to you misses sort of the bulk and beauty of the Christian story. And what you are trying to replace that with is teaching kids who God is, what God is like, God's character, and letting that be the sort of primary means of formation. Does that sound right to you the way I've described it? Yep, that sounds fair. What I often say is that I would posit for folks that perhaps their goal could be to be with their kids as they get to know God so they can discover if God can be trusted. Ah, <sighs> so great. That's better language. Why did I even start by trying no, to? No, I appreciate you offering what you did too. I think that that is a very good summary of where most stuff that's out there tends to lead. Um, yeah. And, and it seems like the, it's definitely the way that I've understood you to kind of set up your own work over and against that stuff is avoiding that kind of, you know, we talked in one of our episodes, we talked about uh, moral therapeutic deism as kind of the, the standard view that a lot of kids get who have like some loose Christian education growing up. And then we've also, yeah. So, so yeah. Okay. That's, this is great. Good, good setting the stage. You did it better than I did. So I want to talk a little bit about, though, those two aspects that I mentioned, and you can weave in your language here as well. First of all, where did you encounter this type of children's education, spiritual education, that was primarily about making them good kids or whatever? Oh, goodness. Where didn't I? Um, there was a major shift in the late 90s, early 2000s 
with the dominance of the suburban megachurch and the ability of the suburban megachurch to publish its curriculum resources. Hmm. And that was coupled with the suburban megachurch putting on its own conferences around a variety of its ministry strategies. So this wasn't just about kids, but if you take Willow Creek, where I eventually worked, but I wasn't working at this time, they hosted like eight conferences a year. Come here and see how we do small groups and then copy it. Come and see how we do arts and copy it. And one of those was a children's conference. And Mm. from there, you could buy Willow Creek curriculum. The same was true of North Point out of Atlanta. They were kind of the two big kids on the block where they were writing their curriculum in-house and they offered that as a product for purchase. Both of those curriculum, uh, curricula, which one's the plural? Now I'm blanking. Curricula. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It it always trips me up. (laughs) Uh, They worked off of a little trio. Know what, as what is it that we want children to learn? Because there's got to be learning happening for this to really, you know, count. This is still Sunday school and so on. Mm -hmm. So what? We will tell them why it matters. And that will be given to them from the lesson, not like discovered by the child. Right. And then now what? Which would then be the action step a child should take, usually like the very next day at school, in order to apply this so what principle to their lives. And that trio was the rubric that all the lessons were created through. And every story they picked from the Bible would be one that they could use and do that with. Um, So at the time that that became really popular, I was a like kids pastor running a fourth to sixth grade room, doing what a lot of churches do, which is you buy box curriculum and then you kind of modify it for your kids in context. And the more we watched it, the more it was like, well, gee, that sure feels like we're making everything about how a kid acts. Mm. It sure seems like we're not doing a lot of critical thinking. It's very one size fits all. Like, what about our kids whose experiences don't fit into any of what we're talking about? Um, And those kinds of things were sort of the early piece. But it was just a very prominent way to make – the good intention was kids can participate in faith. The miss, I think we've seen over time, especially because we've had enough time to watch it play out and to hear from those people who grew up on it and so on. um, The miss was how much it was dictated to kids instead of discovered by kids. Mm. Yeah. So then give us the other side of that. Then if, if the idea is to sit with our kids as they discover whether or not God is trustworthy, as you so eloquently put it. Contrast that with this more didactic, given to them approach. It would look like having a combination of storytelling and practices or habits or rhythms that either talk about or reflect some part of who God is. I would usually advocate for like just one part at a time um, for the sake of creating more space for the conversation. Um And that the idea would be that if a caring adult says to a kid, God is like this, the next thing would be some version of, what do you think of that? Or have you experienced that or not? Is that easy or hard for you to believe about God? Tell me why. So even as an adult says, I think God is a certain way, they would then quickly create space for, but... It takes time to figure out if that's true. It doesn't always seem like God is like that. There often seems to be exceptions. Like, tell me what you think. And that the conversation then gets oriented around the exploration of the degree to which that assertion of God's character resonates or not. And it doesn't have to get closed up with the child agreeing that God is that thing. It is just modeling a conversation that this is what we do. We explore, is God like this or not? Because if God is indeed these key attributes, then that would mean we have a trustworthy God. And if God is not, I can't really blame you for not being sure that you would trust this God. And we all have to recognize that there's going to be an ongoing process of getting to know and re-getting to know this God even for me as an adult. So I'm also in that way kind of equipping a child for the idea that lifelong, we're not, this is not set it and forget it. This is, I'm modeling for you now something I hope you get to carry for always, which is there will be times that something that you thought was true about God might not hold up anymore. 
this is the process that we revisit it with. So it's, it's all of that swirl of conversation, I would say. That's fantastic. I, one kind of silly comment and then a, a more substantive one. The silly one is that we even had a way of joking about this when I was in youth group. You know, maybe as early as fifth or sixth grade, that there was like a Jesus Bible was the joke. It was like, if you answer one or one of those, you'll get it right 75% of the time, yep. which was the joke was that like, there's a pro forma, you know, uh, sit, situation here. And we kind of know what they're expecting of us. And at that point, and that made it boring. And, you know, of course it didn't, Jesus Bible didn't apply all the time, but the fact that we came to that bit so organically says something about at least some of those Sunday school experiences. The more substantive comment is that this reminds me a lot of doing therapy with people. And one of the most important things that a therapist needs to really like get into our thick skulls and it takes time and practice to do this is like, you might have the answer, but you cannot give it to them or think you have the answer. You might even in some cases know that you have the answer. For instance, man, you, you probably need to stop doing meth. <laughs> you know, like sometimes we really know the answer and sometimes we don't know, but we, we have a strong clinical sense. But in all of the cases, telling them that does not, doesn't, is not as effective as they come, them coming to it on their own. And so the skill is to ask the right open-ended questions to get people, clients to find their own way to what will be most helpful for them. And it strikes me that you're just saying something very similar uh, about children. And I, and I, when I have children therapy clients, I, I don't treat them differently than my adult clients in that sense. There are other differences. Like I am a lot more involved with the parents and stuff like that, but, but I'm still like asking them questions to get them to think and make connections because that's always going to make a stronger pathway yeah. for us than yeah. being told and given the answers. Yes, I completely agree. It even just reminds me of like how at a basic level, when we're the speaker, we remember more and make more connections than when we are the listener. Like at a, any educator um, will just say that they'll think about their classrooms, like any kind of learning that has life change involved, even just the simple reality of if I get you to talk it through you will hold on to something very differently than if you listen to me. And so much of good therapy, so much of good faith formation spaces is about, can I create an environment where you know you're safe to work something out aloud? Because if you work it out, that's where you find a lot more impact. Well, that's kind of a nice way into this main question about, you know, where we draw from to describe God's character. So my concern with your approach concerns too strong of a word, but maybe where I get tripped up is maybe interpreting some of what you are putting out there and advocating for. I may be interpreting it a bit too didactically. Like now that you describe it in this more collaborative investigative form, I wonder if the issue is even going to still be there, although I guess it still does start with us saying something about God, right? And then asking them to respond. It's not a pure organic discovery series with our children where like Descartes, they are all, st we're asking them to all start from first principles. I think therefore I am or something like that, right? We're saying God's like this. Um, and so that, you know, that stuff comes from somewhere like where, where are you drawing that initial pool of statements about God or, you know, whatever you believe about God, like, where's it coming from? Yeah. So like, I am personally with my own family, with my own kids. Um, I have a couple things that come to mind. One is with my own kids, with curriculum for kids under five, I am camping out almost exclusively on the idea that God is good. Yeah. And so if I choose to tell them a story from the Bible, which is going to be my main text, yeah, that story is going to be very overt in showing a child under five, an action of God's that is a good action. 
That's so going to be start like with central to the plot. Story choice, right? Yeah. So there's some stories that that really works and some that it, okay, actually let's pause here because I, I have like a real life example just from my own parenting. So on Easter Sunday, we, we actually, I decided to stay home. So I've been taking Soren back to church mm -hmm. and basically I trust that he's just getting a lot of God loves you and type type stuff at this church. Yeah. Um, it, it's Anglican and, and it previously had a reformed kind of Presbyterian past. And I was like, I, he's four. I don't even really know what I want him to know about the crucifixion and resurrection. Mm hmm. Right. Like baby Jesus, the incarnation. <laughs> yep. God, you know, we believe that Jesus, like God, Jesus was God in some unique way or, you know, like that's still weird to talk about with a four year old. It's also weird because I don't know exactly how I think about it. Um, but the death and resurrection stuff feels like, I mean, I don't like when he's eight. I don't I mean, I don't even know. Like it's mm -hmm. it's a weird one and so yeah that kind of thing would be like yeah don't maybe don't choose that story like in in what you're saying like that wouldn't be a place to major at, at his age right i mean i think that you can do this is this is my uh my version of making the conservatives think I'm a heretic. I think you could talk about resurrection sunday without even talking much about good friday. Wow, and so interesting. With young kids we talk we it's a it's a literal single sentence in the entire two page story, which is they made a plan to get rid of Jesus and it worked and he died. It was a sad day. His friends felt sad and they were waiting. And then it takes about three more sentences to get to. We literally just count to three <laughs> and then say they went and they it was empty and they didn't know what it meant and they were so excited and we build right back up. Like you never leave a kid hanging. And so yeah. it is like that is literally all I say um, personally. And what I put in, you know, lessons because you can tell the Sunday story. And I think that that idea that you are allowed to not tell a Good Friday story to a kid who is not ready for it or as a parent who isn't sure what you make of it, like that's okay. Um, let me I, let me ask you to motive, like why, when and why, in your opinion, mm -hmm. Does a kid need to know about the resurrection of Jesus? Like what, what, what are the stakes there? What are they, what are they missing if they don't get that for a while? I think if you delay exploring the resurrection stories, there's probably not a lot of cost benefit on that so much as just reading your own kid and how they may or may not respond to it. Mm -hmm. I think that I'm still of the opinion that the motivation to be a Christian community is most of all around we have the person of Jesus that we follow together. And oh, I am definitely, yeah. And so, like, I think the post resurrection stories, Emmaus Road, Breakfast on the Beach, Upper Room, those are really interesting to children because mm. the people feel everything we're trying to figure out to. Mm. Is any of this real? Was this person legitimate? What do we make of the fact that Rome seemed to have pulled off his execution? Do we keep going or does this make him a total Looney Tunes person that is not worth our time and effort? All of those questions are living and simmering in the post-resurrection stories. Mm. And I think there's a lot of connection to any kid who is also like, so this, this one dude is the whole story's around him. <laughs> and I right. think that is a nice, helpful, like if, if they, if they get to have time and space to figure out if any of this actually holds up, of course we do too. So that particular piece of the resurrection stories, I really enjoy, um, because there's so much connection to like, once you don't need humans to be heroes, and you get to let them be regular, like Thomas becomes awesome because it's like, tell me y'all would not want to be like, nah, dude ain't alive. Right. Unless I, unless right. I touch him. Cause, cause dead people stay dead y'all. Like yeah. these, these people weren't idiots. They know dead people stay dead. So I, that part I think is all just really fascinating space to be in when. Yeah. That's really interesting. I, I'll, I'm going to just, I'll marinate, I'll marinate on that. Um, let's get to this kind of more of the, the core thing here. So Let's say that 
I am someone who I'm really good with my kid knowing that, you know, being told that God is love. By the way, w- when Easter came around, what I did sort of focus on with our eldest was like, I, and actually in recent years, I've, I found myself really appreciating that Easter is celebrated around the spring equinox or whatever that is. Yeah. Uh, you know, as new life is forming out of old dead life from the winter yeah. and fall. And like, I, I actually really, really love the poetic nature of that sort of the yeah. Theo poetics of it yeah. is becoming more important to me. So I, I just kind of leaned into there that like, yeah, we celebrate, you know, the, <laughs> I forget what I said. I, I mean, I, I really fumbled. I mean, I, <laughs> I would not, I would never transcribe what I said to him this year and, and recommend it to anybody. Yeah. I was really, I was just jumping all over. Um, but, but focusing on new life and spring and Easter yep. Sunday is a day that we celebrate, you know, the new life that God gives us every year as we look around at the baby animals being born and, you know, whatever, yep. Which, yep. which is like literally like a, an important part of, of my enjoyment of, of the year, you know, is, totally. is enjoying spring. Yeah. So I found something there that I felt like I could kind of hang my hat on, mm-hmm. but what it brings up is this more general problem that I think is not only mine, but many listeners. And that is like, some of us aren't, you know, don't even use the word Christian, aren't sure if where we would fit into that or other stories and yet have children and are convinced as I am by the research on giving our children access to some sort of a faith story and life if for no other reason that even if it's all false, they have it as a tool if their life gets really rough. Mm -hmm. I mean, like that's the back, that's the ultimate backstop for me with my boys is like, I want them, I want them to have this capacity built up so that if they need it, they can use it. And then I also, there's more flourishing and, and, you know, I use it as much more than a backstop and I hope that they will too, but at the very least, right. So Mm -hmm. someone might be convinced of that, but just like, I don't know what God's like. And so I just, that's the kind of main thing I wanted to throw into the ring for us to talk about. Yeah. And what I appreciate about what you already said about Easter is like, you found something to hang your hat on. Yeah. I think that, um, many of us were not at all introduced to faith in ways that that would like occur to us as a thing we can do where it's like, well, if we're saying we're going to explore who God is or what God's like, you also get to pick Mm. which attributes you believe should be highlighted or leaned into. And you can pick out of your own wisdom and judgment, which ones at a minimum maybe get saved for later or are too confusing for meaningful conversation in this season of your kid's life and development. You actually do get to choose that. And so when that uh, is sort of established, I think one thing it does to free people up is like, what's your short list? Like you can go a long way with a kid on if there's a God, the God must be good to be worth bothering yeah. with. Yeah. And let me talk to you about what I think it would mean for a God to be good or stories that I believe point to the idea that there is a good God Spring creation being one of those, like yeah. new life coming back every time and it takes care of us and it's pretty and it's cute. Like yeah. that is an interesting idea. If there's a God, part of the reason I'm saying that God is good is because baby bunnies are stinking cute and, well, and why not do cute? <laughs> I, lo- I do kind of love that, you know, there's, there's different ways to sort of take the theological element of it deeper. If you want to say there's a... I don't know. There's like a kid's communication element. And then there's like, what are we communicating? We might call that the theological element. Yep. And, you know, listeners of this show by definition, basically have spent some time reworking and rethinking and tossing some things out and trying out new things in that world. But also just something really basic, like if, if any version at all of not just Christianity, but like, theism, any sort of theism with any sort of loving intentionality from creator God or what rephrase that however you want. If any of that's true at like a metaphysical ontological level, then it's, it is actually quite fun to think about how you would phrase that for a child. 
Yeah. Like that is really good news. And even though I don't know that that's true, like that is the thing that I have faith in that, that that's in, that's the more logically prior thing that I have faith in before any sort of Christian distinctives Mm -hmm. apply. Like Mm -hmm. it's not that we are all just chemicals and it's entirely meaningless unless you choose to make it meaningful. Right. Which is what other people believe. Yeah. And some days I believe that. Uh, most days I believe that for some of the day is probably the better, the better way to say it. <laughs> but I don't live as if that's true. I live as if the other story is true. And mm-hmm. and that I I don't I don't think that's gonna change. Um but thinking I'm taking a long time to get here, I apologize, but thinking of then what does that mean? Like how do I communicate that to a four-year-old? It's actually a, a fun, kind of tricky problem. Recently I've just been doing a lot of who does God love? And then he says, mm-hmm. God loves everything, everyone. Mm-hmm. I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. God yep. does. And, and like that even feels like that's plenty for months and months. And that might be good for six yeah. months. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that there is a longer shelf life to a lot of these ideas when we expect it to be that we're in ongoing conversation with the actual kids in our lives. Hmm. <laughs> so much of, I don't know, so much of the like resourcey, booky, devotionally junk out there, it's just too much content, like flat out. Yeah. It is too much content. And then we wonder if what we're supposed to do is replace all of that content with simply like With more better, better content, yeah. I actually don't think that's the no, thing. No, that's I- another therapy tie-in. I mean, I, I think about, I'm thinking of, of clients right now that I know, I know for a fact that their faith is a major source of comfort and motivation. And also if I ask them to list out all the things they believe about God, it might be like five or six items long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, like it's not a lot. They don't spend a ton of time thinking about it. It isn't, they don't go into a lot of detail the way that I do and my listeners do. Right. And you don't know if your kids are going to be like you, you have permission listener or me, or if they're going to be like my wife who doesn't listen at all and doesn't need to, and is not yeah. frankly that interested in it. Like, I don't know what my kids are going to be like, and they might end up being the person with five or 10 bullet points that gets them through their yeah. entire spiritual life. I yeah. don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if the idea is that we were exploring the idea that there is a being that we relate to, hmm. I also find that incredibly helpful when I think about my kids because any building of genuine relationship is much slower going. Yeah. When I put my kid in elementary school, I crank through curriculum and in 180 classroom days, we have mastered a giant list of concepts. Mm. I don't think that's a parallel for this process. Yeah. When I introduce my kid to a stranger that I think they actually could become very comfortable with and see as safe and a source of security. I expect my kid to take, I'm somewhere in the neighborhood of months to years yeah. to get to that point. And really if good. my kid shows hesitation or doubt or discomfort, I trust that they know what they know about mm. that. And so we work that through. I, you know, I, I've been thinking about this recently as well it's come up in my own mind as I'm like talking with my son, but Tanya Lerman, who's a sociologist of religion, not herself religious. She wrote an incredible book, which is based on this big embedded research study she did with vineyard goers in, I think Minneapolis. And it's called when God talks back is the name of the book. And the sort of the important takeaway for our conversation here is that, from a sociological perspective, she's not, she's got no uh, horse in the race theologically, but she's like, look, this, this group of people who have a profoundly conversational relational interaction with God, uh, this is a, this is a church that has curriculum for adults on how to sit down at your kitchen table with an empty mug for Jesus and like, practice the sense that you are having coffee with Jesus. And they don't do that in, it's not, it's not silly. It's like 
the, the idea with this particular group of vineyard people is you can develop this capacity for a two way conversational thing with, with the divine. Yeah. And what I think is so interesting about that is that whether or not there is quote unquote, anyone there on the other line, right. Even if we're, even if that's wrong and we're sort of self-deceived about that, the capacity thing needs to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. And so one way, the way that even just this last week, the way that I found myself thinking about it for my son is like, I want, I do want him to develop something like the capacity I have for turning my attention to God, either, you know, like to use um, Annie Dillard's uh, book title, Help, Thanks, Wow. Yes. So those are her three prayers, Yep. you know, and, th and three different ways that you might turn that attention to God. And, and I, and I do it and I've done it through seasons of more confidence and, and more doubt and, and whatever. Yep. And I, so I've started to say that too, of like, you know, you can tell God anything or you can ask God anything yep. just of like pr priming him for like, you know, there is this other thing than just talking to other people. Mm -hmm. And you can do it and you can learn it and you can become more comfortable with it. And that is just mechanistically true, whether yeah. or not God exists, whatever that means. It's interesting. Right. It is. It really is. And even as you introduce those conversations, you are implicitly representing something about attributes of God that, again, you're not forcing your kid to agree oh, with you about. that's so good because right, he's picking up saying, on how I talk about yeah, it. What yeah. What you're saying is God is approachable. Yes. What you're saying is God yes. is interested in what you have to say. Oh, Meredith. You're yes. saying God is um, able to handle whatever your actual truth is, no matter how clumsily or bluntly or angrily you say it. You are representing certain things about the character of God in the way you talk about learning to pray or practicing prayer. Wow. And you don't have to name those out loud for that to still be, I mean, part of why you chose the strategy you chose about that conversation is about certain things related to who the God would be that you'd be engaging in prayer with. Yes. And again, with the space for, and also kiddo, if it comes down to it and you think there is no God to pray to later on, we're going to be okay. And you're yeah. showing that in the way you talk about it, Yeah, that your relationship is not going to be threatened by your kid's agreement with your conclusions. Oh, that's huge. Huge. Yeah. And that's, that's a perfect example of the type of cycles that I think most of us are trying to break. Um, not, I didn't get that from my parents, thankfully. Uh, but, but even, even them being like, you know, California evangelical, which is, I still think a very good, <laughs> a good term for what I got growing up. Uh, California evangelical with like a, with a, with a twist of mainline thrown in, uh, nice, nice. even then, like, you know, with, especially with my mom, like I remember hearing her say things occasionally, like, I just can't imagine like my children not being with me in heaven and what, how I now interpret that as she is sort of a victim of a certain kind of worldview that was presented to her yeah. that, that would make her panic about that. Right? right. That that would become a source of anxiety for her. Right. Uh, and I don't blame her for that at all. But like, you know, that stuff, if that is how a parent feels like it's going to end, it's going to end up in the water supply, so to speak, at your home. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that a lot of us may or may not be aware of just how loud those messages were for any parent who is roughly now in their 50s or 60s. Yeah. Um, and so they did the best they could out of the parts of them that sincerely loved God. And yeah. then the things they were told that meant when it came to family life. Um, but it, yeah, I was just thinking too, as you were talking about that of like, I get a lot of questions, for instance, from parents saying like, how do I get my kid to pray? You know, like they don't want to pray out loud. How do I get them to pray? And I'm like, oh, ooh, no, no. You, you don't. Because <laughs> if you tell them to pray, yeah. you are saying God cares that you perform this action, mm. whether you want to or not, feel comfortable or not, feel clumsy or not. I, whatever, I, I am of the opinion that God could not care less if your kid does or does not pray to them by some magical age. Though I do think God would love to be in an ongoing conversational right. connection with your child. Right. And those are very different. And so yeah. then it's like, well, if God would love to be in conversation with our kids, make our kids start to practice praying. No, 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 no. Like that's, <laughs> that yeah. is not what we do with that attribute. 
Yeah. If, if that is what God is like, then then I will talk to you about how it feels funny sometimes because it's not like talking to one another where we hear each other. Mm-hmm. I will talk to you about, I will be the one who prays out loud for as long as it takes. Um, which like my own child, my older son is now 11. He has prayed aloud that I have heard less than 10 times. Yeah. In, and most of those have been in the last two years um, where he's offered and we're like, cool, sounds great. Yeah. Um, and it is a practice to not freak out about some script that was told to me about how that should start happening, certainly younger than 10 and 11. Yeah. Hmm. Um, well, I want to kind of, so I want to wrap up this section here and maybe synthesize it a bit before we move on to this Lord's Prayer conversation. So I'm hearing you say a lot of things. Um, a couple of things that have jumped out to me is you may not need, first of all, you don't necessarily need all that much content, all that many stories. You can, you can go a long time with a few greatest hits. That's number yes, one. Absolutely. Number two, the, the main posture here is of invitation, not of teaching. Mm-hmm. Right. And that also frees up a lot of space for parents who are in different positions, sort of with their level of confidence about various things to still, whatever, turn, just translate that into an invitation to your children and see what they do with it kind of a thing, you know? Um, and you, and like you can, and that you can start to make them feel comfortable and, uh, and start to develop that capacity for their own prayer life you can do that very slowly and you can, you can do it primarily through example with, with very little, yeah, very little cognitive content is, is a, a phrase I use a lot in therapy is that's the thing you're thinking, but then there's also these emotions, there's these sensations, there's whatever, right? So you don't need a lot of cognitive content there. And then finally, the other thing I'm picking up on, and then I want you to fill in whatever I missed is that if, if, if we are inviting kids into something that is relational with God, even in just the basic psychological sense that whether or not God's there, they are engaging in a relational activity. It is a communicative activity. It's a, it's a turning of attention toward God or the universe or whatever, much like we turn attention toward another individual, right? That it's that kind of a thing that that probably ought to start and move slow. Um, And in fact, the sort of let's get all these boxes checked. So mom and dad's anxiety can go away approach is, and that's what I, we, we agree. That's really the, the driver there. Yes. Um, and it, and that's what I think my mom was a victim of. And my, my mom, by the way, Ruthie Koch, she's the shit. She's so great. <laughs> she's become a hero of mine. I- incredible into her, into her sixties and just love her to death. Um, so just to be clear, I'm not being overly critical of her, but I think she was a victim of that. She was a pastor's kid and, and had her own, has her own story there so that it can be slow. It's not about them showing us as quickly as possible that they're on the right team. Yeah. It is like, if you really want them to trust, then that needs to be an organic process. Yeah. And I'm going to throw in that again, if there is a God worth trusting involved in this whole process, and that God is too stupid to know that a kid needs time. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Like, no, thank you. I think that goes without saying for my audience, but, but maybe not all the audiences that you end up engaging with. And it could be your audience's in-laws that like, sure. Oh, sure. <laughs> that are the one, right. They, yeah. Anything on a timetable that has deadlines, then there's fear that is driving that deadline. It's fear. And that fear to me means you have a very, then I immediately, I become suspicious of the God that wants yeah. that yep. at a, and I just, I mean, part of it is I simply do not believe right. that Same. that is, but um, I think that's just that awareness of if you are forging a new way out of a system with deadlines and timetables, somebody who would like you to conform to that is afraid. Yeah. And on the one hand, if you can find compassion towards them, great. And on the other hand, to recognize um, putting that system in play for a kid implies there's something about God to be scared of. And uh, yeah, like pass on that. Yeah. 
So okay, well that's okay. That's great. Great summation of that first section. Now we're going to turn to this this question from Abigail, uh, which I'll read uh, verbatim. Please help me craft a prayer I can say with my kids at night that acknowledges a higher power, asks for protection, and includes gratitude, but doesn't come with the baggage of the Lord's Prayer. Now, Meredith, you may already have some prayers that you could pull on here, but I thought that first we would use this as a rubric to talk. So I followed up with her and I said, what specifically is the baggage? And she gave me four items. Number one, the patriarchal reference of God as father. Number two, the feeling of God being far away, quote, in heaven. Number three, a reference to sin. She says, I'm still not sure what sin is. Um, and number four, there in the Lord's Prayer, there's no explicit language of love toward ourselves and others, right? So there's no love God, love your neighbor as yourself. That's nowhere in the Lord's Prayer. And I get the, the sense that she'd like to have something, that being kind of the foundational posture of what we want a, a kid to learn growing up with some Christian faith. It's, it's odd that that wouldn't be in there. So that's not a great candidate for a, for a bedtime prayer. Well, I mean, first thing we can say is maybe don't use the Lord's prayer as a bedtime prayer. Maybe there's other, there's maybe other great ones, but uh, so what, let's start there. If you've got a couple candidates for bedtime prayer, like just read a couple of them for us here and let's people can sure. kind of use them if they like. And then, but then I think it is still interesting to talk through those, those four points more conversationally. Yeah. Um, I know that for some families, Psalm 23, which is the Lord is my shepherd mm. and I won't want, and God makes me lie down in green pastures and God's leading me behind still waters is It often. makes me think of attachment and like, just, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know enough to say how and if parents like create secure attachment to God, I, I, those, those terms still are not clear enough for me in the way that they are clear about caregivers and attachment to them. Right. But it does have attachment vibe to it of like, yeah. God can help me soothe my body. Mm -hmm. God can calm my anxiety. Yeah. You know, God is with me when things are hard. I mean, that's gold. Yeah. Yeah. And you can pick a translation and uh, to the, right. to the um, pronoun thing, you can always swap in a God or a singular they. I mean, that I just, I forgot anytime. to say, well, well, we'll get to right? this, but, uh, Soren started calling God he, and I was like, I think he's old enough for this. And I was like, you know, God's not a he, actually. And now he repeats that back to, like, his mom and stuff. And Jeffrey's like, Soren told me God's not a he? She's like, I was like, I think he can just get that, right? Yep. That, like, yep. you know, Jesus was a he, but God's yep. not. He doesn't totally. Of course, he can't. Yep. I mean, I can barely put those together. He right. can't put those together and have them make sense. But like, I was like, I don't, I don't like that. I thought God was a he my oh, yeah. whole childhood. God's obviously think, not a he. I think yeah. it's okay. Start. I I don't, what do you think? That's what I've been doing. I think you can start really early. I often just say God isn't a boy or a girl. Yeah. Like, and it's just, so, you know, it's one of those that I don't, I have opted away from correcting any kid. Mm-hmm for that habit because it's so pervasive yeah, that yeah. even people who aren't holding on to the idea, it's just, so no, that it, part always it's is a like, language, oh, yeah. it's but, a feature of English yeah. language in a way that's that, not, does not uh, indict everybody that does right. it. Right. Absolutely. But I think it's very easy, even very young to be like, oh yeah, I know God's not a boy or a girl. God's God. Yeah. That's yeah, usually I think my, it made sense to him, frankly. Yes. I don't think it was a, I, I think it was fine. Like, and also I thought, well, he's at the age where he's really aware of boys and girls and what that yeah. means. So maybe it is a good time developmentally. I, and I'm not a developmental psychologist. That's not my area of specialty. I have had some some children clients uh, and I've learned a bit about it. But like, I, you know, yeah. I'm not a developmentalist, so I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. It's, I mean, same. It's more of the, I'm, I'm the practitioner who watches lots of children and tries to be yeah. careful with them. <laughs> okay. So Psalm 23 um, oh, is an option. Psalm 23 is one that's come up. Um. I had, similarly, I had friends ask if, uh, they, for ideas. And so collectively we came up with, and this would be more if you have kids that would appreciate a rhyme. So I'm going to hmm. guess like maybe eight and under, um, if you're, if they're older than maybe they would find it too young in terms of being rhymed, but it would say, our day is nearly done. We come to you in prayer to tell you how we really feel because we know you care. Everything we did today, you were also there. We thank you, God, for who you are as we fall asleep and wake tomorrow in your love so high and wide and deep. 
That's cool. I like that. Okay. That was that was what we came up with together for similar reasons. Yeah. Okay. Well, so those are some alternatives. Um, I I'm gonna look at what translations we have of Psalm 23 for kids. Uh, and you know, there's like the Desmond Tutu kids Bible that he mm-hmm. put out that we, I don't know, we have a copy of, copy of it somewhere. We kind of like, I kind of overdid it when he was born and I was like, oh, I'm not gonna be able to use these resources for five years. And I just like <laughs> yeah. lent them out to people and I don't even know who has them. So yeah. I have to reapproach. But um, yes. now let's talk about the, these four things. So patriarchal reference. I mean, maybe we could just talk about these less as a reference to the Lord's prayer. I mean, we can talk about that. But actually, maybe they're more interesting just as like lenses of speaking to our kids about God in general. Right. Right. So father, I guess we've sort of already we've already covered that one. Let's move to number two. I, well, can I add one oh, quick yeah, thing please. on that, which is that sometimes with kids, it can be helpful to remind them that they're going to see the word father a lot because the Bible comes from its own time and place and culture. Oh, And so that's a great time to remind it. them. They're going to say that a father at that point had a job to care and take care of the whole group. Yeah. So this would make people feel safe and cared for and protected, like giving them a reason that goes beyond, because it's true, it's not invoked for the sake of patriarchy. Right. It's invoked because of other cultural reasons. And anytime you can remind kids that the Bible is time-stamped, and then we get to be curious about what we hear in it. Um, I think that can always be a good thing for them. I mean, that's so interesting because that is ultimately what I am. That is exactly what I'm coming up against as I work with therapy clients Mm -hmm. who are trying to move on from certain forms of thinking about God in the world that are not serving them at all, not serving their faith, not serving their flourishing. um, And, you, the problem there, the, the hardest part of the programming, the part that goes deepest, I think it tends to be uh, related to, to the opposite of what you just said. So it tends to be related to something where we get the impression as children that the primary thing is that we have a certain set of boxes checked correctly and the, the the specific list varies, of course, from denomination to denomination. And that's the whole point of the therapeutic cognitive work is for them to then see that and recognize that they got one version of it. But there are a hundred other versions that are substantively quite different that they might have gotten if they'd been born somewhere else. And is that a good enough reason that this first one's true just because you were born there and not born there? Like, that's not faith like you know like that that is just uh self-protection essentially which i get the psychological need for that but it's not faith and so i love that idea of starting them early on well we're going to explore this yeah if god's good then god can handle this stuff you know that kind of a thing yeah 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 no i that makes a ton of sense um listening as you described that that we we fall into what we were given in part because it in some way was required for our safety and security. Yeah. And that it can keep us from feeling the freedom that we deserve to look through other very, yeah, very different versions and say like, what kind of life is offered there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's a fun, that's a fun tie in. All right. Number two, the feeling of God being far away, quote, in heaven. I think you and I agree that as adults, we don't understand the Lord's prayer this way. We chatted briefly about this beforehand, right? Like the, the way that I understand Jesus to have meant the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and I'm drawing on N.T. Wright from a long reading N.T. Wright 10 plus years ago. But I don't think that this is controversial among New Testament scholars that like the kingdom of heaven that Jesus describes is like this imminent inbreaking of basically the way that the world would be if God were really in charge or if it if it were if we were all you know doing what God would have us do on earth as it is in heaven, like then it would look like this glorious, you know, loving, reciprocal, flourishing community. And so that's what it, on earth as in heaven me, but yes. our father who art in heaven. So it starts yeah. off, you get that distance and then 
on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, yeah. maybe we're connecting those. And for me, there's no there's no distance anymore. But I can right. very much see that for my four year old, mm-hmm. oh, he's in heaven. I'm on earth. Like that's obviously that's as distant as you could get. So I, I think there's an interesting, like as adults, I'm cool with that. But that's a it's a good point about children. Yeah. Yes, it is. And probably separately then would be where you're having a conversation about, like, I often say to kids, God in heaven is an expression Mm. for the idea that they see God as big, as everywhere, as greater than. And so wherever God is, they're going to call that heaven because there's something unique about God and God kind of gets a place. But it's not like it's an actual place on a map. You couldn't get in a rocket ship and get there. And also, this is where I also find, like, I think it is cool how Genesis 1, for instance, is a, like, temple creating story. Like, it parallels ancient Near Eastern temple creations and all the gods make their temples for their comfort. They conveniently install a king who's the only one made in God's image and all the people make the king and thereby the gods happy. Hmm. And... Genesis one has a fun feature in being temple creating, but then it's the whole world. And so if what, like, give me a rough age. Cause like, I'm like, Oh, my four year old is nowhere near that. Yeah. Oh, I think probably like seven or eight when you've already told the story other ways. Yeah. Then you add in the layer of saying, Hey, did you know there's other stories like it where it's as if it's God making a temple or a palace or a special place to live only instead of it being one little building in one little place with one king, it's like all the trees in the forest Hmm. are the beams of the temple. It's like all the stars in the sky are the ceiling of it. And everywhere we go, there's our loving God because it's like the whole world belongs. And so you you don't do that the first time you tell the story. It's like a new way. This is also, by the way, how you keep kids from saying they're bored and know all the Bible stories is you like pocket these little nuggets. And then when they get older, it's like, hey, did you know this other neat thing? And it's with a posture of fun fact, not now here's the next (laughs) lesson in your biblical education. Yeah, yeah. It gives fresh life to stuff, which is what a lot of us are doing. I mean, part of this whole Lord's Prayer exploration right now is we need space to revisit this prayer that might've been given to us as a rote set of words that we were supposed to recite every Sunday in a drone with a bunch of strangers shoulder to shoulder. And so, of course, you need the chance to come back and say, well, what is this prayer saying about who God is or what God's like? And is God far away in heaven or is that capturing something different? Yeah, no, I, I love that. It, what's interesting for me is that that rote thing just does not, that's not my story. Like yeah. uh, re-engaging faith as a college kid and then early touring person for me was like first re-engaging it in like Catholic churches with a lot of rote, you know, whatever, but that really worked for me and helped me. And then reading Catholics, reading Orthodox writers like Dostoevsky and, uh, Merton and Merton and Endo and Catholicism. And like that brought me back. So, so my own faith is like, you know, I'm just like a couple clicks from becoming Catholic. It it feels to me a lot of time. So, but I recognize that that is a very common, you know, experience. So I I just don't, I don't read that one in as often because my experience is almost mirror opposite. Yeah. Yeah. And I do think it's probably worth noting. It's not that the repetition takes away from its meaning. It's often that the adults forget to remind the kids what it means so that they can participate in the repetition. Yeah. It's not the form. It's the being invited into why. It's the being invited in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We got. Two more of these Lord's Prayer ones. So number three, uh, the reference in the Lord's Prayer to sin and Abigail's like, I'm still not sure what sin is. And that just opens up a really interesting topic. Like Meredith, do you want to riff a little bit on sin and and how you talk about it at what age and all that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I usually say to kids a couple of things. I tell them a lot. God dreams of a world that works in a way that matches who God is. So if God is loving, God would hope the world would be loving. If God is patient, God would hope people would respond in patience. And that's often a space where I can say something like, so tell me something you think about who God is. And they offer an attribute. And it's like, okay, so what would that look like if people did that? 
that then becomes the sounding board for a conversation about sin as an opposite. Sin would be the ways the world works that keeps it from matching who God is. It would be the things people do where they only look out for themselves and don't care about others. It would be systems that keep people from all having enough of what they need, even if they work super hard. It would be, and example lists could go on, examples age with the kids. But this idea that, uh, I kind of like how Paul often, sin is like personified, but it's kind of like a force. It's just this thing that is working against purposes of flourishing and goodness and life and abundance. And it's not even that a person who gets finds themselves participating in them is a bad person so much as it is there's always this presence within the world that is not bringing about goodness mm. and people in a lot of ways people are like victims of that yeah um and so that is often where i am trying to start with kids is i sometimes say to make it like kid language i would say something like sin is like god's opposite if God's always wanting life and goodness and connection, sin's the stuff that leaves people feeling sad or lonely all the time. Like they don't have people to be with or, you know, which being careful of like not their sadness as a form of sin, no emotion is that. Mm -hmm. But this idea that um, that stuff in the way that's working against you, that it just feels like it won't get any better. Um, I never worry about trying to talk about a, Satan figure or personified, you know, yeah. that kind of way. You can just talk about how things work. Kids see it. They get it pretty easy. This one is just a tricky one for me. I love what you said, by the way. Uh, but it's just like, I don't really know. I have not landed anywhere on, on this one, even with adults. And yeah. becoming a therapist has actually further complicated it, I think. Because... I, I was an anxious kid and my fundamental orientation to Christianity is in, in the William James model of sick soul religion or healthy minded religion. Healthy minded is like, uh, I'm like Rob Bell, uh, Oprah, um, well, who's the guy's name? Eckhart Tolle, like stuff that's like focusing on the motivation and the positives and the love and the compassion that brings forward the best version of someone. Mm -hmm. and, and it's almost like a personality level thing of what people uh, respond to more. Mm -hmm. And then sick soul is like, that's religion that starts with, you know, the darkest aspects of the human experience and the world. Yeah. And it, it tries to give an accounting of that. Right. And that's where it starts. And I, I think what I've landed on is like, ultimately I want a religion that actually does both. Um, and with, but with clients, like I don't do a lot of sick soul stuff, you know, it's right. like, it's not, there may be times where, I, I don't know. I, I, it's, it's hard. This one's really unformed for me. I mean, but you know, working through people's trauma and stuff like that is like, you know, no mere healthy minded approach is, is going to be enough for that. Like you really got to, the body yeah. keeps the score. You have to go in and excavate, you know? So I don't yeah. know. There, there's language for both of them yeah. around all of that, but sin is interesting mm -hmm. because some of what made me need six soul religion was I think an inaccurate understanding of my own propensity to sin mm. and whatever evilness might've been in my heart. Almost, almost everything that I felt awful for as a kid and a teenager, I now think was not bad. Right. And the things that I actually think were bad are like these other things and yeah. not at all what I was focused on. And so, you know what I'm saying? So there's a, yeah. this one's really unfinished for me. I think that makes a lot of sense. And it often with, children, we populate our examples of sin with personal choice and often with examples that a kid might participate in. And so we describe it, but then we talk about things like lying to their parents or cheating right. on a test. But I, I shy away from that quite a bit and tend to talk a lot more about sin 
in examples that are um, out in the world yeah, that systemic. a kid might be able to observe yeah. and systemic. Yeah. Um, I tend to talk even, I mean, because part of it is even, I don't know that you necessarily need the vocabulary word to be talking about the ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, the word can be helpful to sum up, but you can be talking about, we have this propensity in the world. There, There is a power thing yeah. that, you know, some subset of the population really stinks at and it hurts people. Yeah. And again, I there's a character of God thing that cares that it hurts you people. You like to say subset of the population to your children? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. You sound like me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so the, but there's a um, point being that I think a lot of times with kids, sin is only a verb. It's all actions that you participate in or not. And they're either sinful or not. Right. So much of the story of scripture, sin is like an adjective. It is describing something people see and experience and are sometimes victimized by. And yes, sometimes participate in. And the problem with part being a participant is that you hurt someone. And so wanting to be cognizant to this idea of why does this prayer reference sin? Because we want to be people who are humble enough to admit when we're part of the harm and we go seeking out mending and forgiveness. And, and that doesn't have to make you a terrible worm of a child. It means in our family, if I, as the grown up, lose my shit, you had better believe that I'm going to come back and mend that with you mm. because that is not okay. We are yeah. people who apologize and mend and forgive. And we work that process because it is life-giving for all of us to know that we are going to be able to own what we did wrong and it's going to be okay. We don't have to be perfect. And that we're going to practice forgiving those who have wronged us and that can take time and that's okay. All of that I think is born out of whatever working definition of sin we have it helps speak to that kind of stuff. It, I, you cheated on your test, kid. We'll figure it out. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, I care more about why you thought you had to because exactly, I couldn't well, care less what the, you had happen on that test. That's the therapy <laughs> side, right? Yep, it's like yep. that's now how I think about those problems. Is yep. okay. Wh wh where'd that come from? <laughs> like, yeah. let's figure it out because I, I, you know, there there are some areas where psychological education has given me the language to express why I just fundamentally disagree with certain worldview tenets that I was raised with. Mm -hmm. One of those tenets is like the most important thing to understand about people is that they are inherently sinful and in need of God's grace. And I'm just like, I don't know. That's false. Like that's yeah. just not true. Not the most important thing to understand about people. Um, it is the most important thing for a very particular theology Yes. Uh, and, and that is, I think, where sin gets brought in most commonly for kids is in that context. And it's why I gave my life to Christ at the ripe age of six, because I had been yes. unnecessarily motivated for me that I was sinful and, you know, deserving of hell or something. Right. Yep. Even in my California evangelicalism. Yeah. 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 So we got one more here. Um, there's no explicit language in the Lord's prayer of love toward ourselves, love of others. You know, uh, I'm thinking of just Jesus saying that the whole of the law and the prophets is love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself, which is yeah. a fantastic summing up of the Christian life and one that I will be leaning on with my kids. Um, the Lord's prayer doesn't have everything in it, I guess. Right. I mean, I, is it meant to be standalone? I, I don't know. Not necessarily. I don't think it necessarily has to be comprehensive yeah. uh, at all. And also I think to what you already said about kingdom language, that's what's implied. If yeah. God's kingdom comes, if God's will is done, right. then we are living lives of love. I think that- But the it, verb but the verb tense is supplicating and asking God, right? There, There is an active part of forgiving, yeah. forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those- Mm -hmm. who trespass against us mm -hmm. or debts, depending on how you're looking at it. So there is an element of like, we have, we have a part in this, in the prayer, but it's, it is still, yeah, I, I get how that's, it's not oh, yeah. as good of a summation ethically right. speaking. Yeah. And I think if you're talking about kids, Concrete is always preferable. And so mm. one of my own questions about using the Lord's Prayer with children is simply that this is a lot of metaphor. It's a lot of imagery. Yeah. And it's stacked up. Like 
metaphor on metaphor on metaphor. And so there's just a developmental side of me that's thinking you need time. Yeah, this to is this is not unpack for kids. it all. I no, so- it really is Soren, buddy. Um which trespasses against you have you forgiven <laughs> this right, week? Right. Yes. <laughs> when your kid took the shovel, you know, when your friend took the <laughs> shovel at school. Um, yeah. So it, there, there may just be like a larger Lord's prayer is not really for kids. Like it's, it's for adults. It's, it's yeah. Non-concrete, more abstract language that if I remember correctly from developmental classes, the abstract thought of that nature is really more of like a junior high and on type of a thing, mm-hmm. maybe around the time of, of confirmation classes in, you know, uh, more right. liturgical, um, forms of Christianity, like Catholicism. Yep. Which is what those are meant for. I mean, right. the big reason to put them at the time they were is that they are meant to be question driven, exploratory times with caring adults to work things out. Wow. <laughs> And that's the reason yeah. they're put at the time they're put is yeah. that there were people aware that before that yeah. kids couldn't engage those yeah. kinds of things. And I, so you I put did it confirmation the in eighth could. grade, you know, say, so very similar, even that we yeah. had a little mainline flavor, as I said. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, Meredith, I, I think we got through everything. This has been so great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It's always so fun to talk with you. I love about having it. you on the show. Uh, give us the links. That, like, if there's two places you would most want people to go, where would they be? Oh, I wrote a book and I'm always supposed to ask people if they would consider purchasing it. So it's called Woven, Nurturing a Faith Your Kid Doesn't Have to Heal From. And to our earlier uh, episode that we did, a lot of it is we've had this research on faith formation for a while. We're overdue on responding to it in ways that give kids the time and space that they really need. Mm -hmm. And so it's got some research insights and some ideas that you get to sort of pick and choose because you and your kid get to make it fit. Mm -hmm. And then right now for anyone who is kind of inclined towards wanting to explore Bible stories with kids and maybe would like to do that in ways that are helpful and not harmful, I am doing weekly Substack. Uh, So meredithannmiller.substack.com. It's one Bible story that I have written a paraphrase for uh, and then given some ideas for how you could explore wonder questions with it and play a game around it or pray on it. And you don't have to do any of it. You can pick and choose like a menu. And then it also comes with this fun commentary context cheat sheet that we're writing around all the stuff kids ask about that's weird in the story that a lot of us, if we didn't get to nerd out about Bible stuff, we don't know the answer. So hopefully we're given some of that. So those are my big two at the moment that I'm hoping are helpful for folks. I have just subscribed to that. It's called it's called Kids Plus Faith. That's the name of the that's your title of your Substack, right? Yes. This is the yes. correct one. Yes. Um, fantastic. I I have not been following close enough to realize that I could get that in my inbox every week, and so now I will be, and I'm grateful for that. I'm so glad. <laughs> I uh, hope it's keep fun. Keep it up. We're going to be in touch. Thank you. I'm sure I'll have you back in not too long. Thanks so much, Meredith. Thank you.